coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borag Fung, Earthlets, tis I, Molchar, your host of the 2000 AD Thrillcast Lockdown Tapes. I hope you are all keeping well. Um, this week, we are, we're not talking about a 2000 AD publication. <gasps> we're talking about uh, a new book out from uh, Sequart uh, called Judging Dread, which has been edited by Scott Weatherly and is a series of uh, essays Examining the world of Judge Dredd from different perspectives. So you've got pieces on the dark judges, on surveillance technology, on robots in Dredd's world, on um, uh, issues of peace and security and kind of like the post 9-11 world and whatnot. Um, really great and fascinating book. Uh, it's got a foreword by uh, Matt Smith, Thargs Underling, uh, and uh, an interview with Dredd writer Rob Williams. And it's available from, from uh, Secart. Just uh, putting it in front of the camera for those watching on uh, uh, on YouTube. Um, that's available from their web- from their website. So what I thought it'd be really interesting to do because it's it's so great to see uh, other publishers uh, begin to explore and examine uh, dread in interesting ways uh, beyond the stuff that uh, that we at Rebellion put out. I thought it'd be great to to get Scott and a couple of the writers uh, onto the podcast to just talk things through. So we've, we, we've got Scott, we've got, um, Tony Farina and we've got, uh, Julian Darius, who, uh, is founder of, uh, Sequart. So, uh, really great chat between the four of us about, uh, issues within Judge Dredd, our own reaction to Judge Dredd. Uh, Tony and Julian are, are, are both Americans, so they bring a, a perspective as well. Um, for Scott, this is the first time he's actually edited, uh, something along these lines. So it's, uh, fantastic that he's chosen to focus on Judge Dredd. So we're going to, uh, yeah, hear from them, uh, in a little bit. Should be, uh, should be a good chat in the meantime. I hope you are all keeping up to date on the latest news from 2000 AD at 2000 com forward slash newsletter with the weekly thrill mail that, uh, that goes out every Wednesday. Um, and also, uh, we have got some absolutely cracking collections coming up over the next few months we've got uh the hershey collection Rob williams and simon fraser we've got dreadnoughts which is uh michael uh, michael carroll john higgins and sarah jane hurst we've got um the megatropolis collection by kenneth neumann and dave taylor uh, the you know such a strong back-end list of, of of this year so um Newsletter is one way to keep up. Uh, go along to 2080.com and uh, explore the stuff that we've got in the shop. That's enough blurb for now. So uh, we're going to crack on and hear from Tony Farina, Julian Darius, Scott Witherly, and myself about Judging Dread. So it's uh, wonderful to welcome our guests uh, to uh, to the uh, this uh, special episode where we're talking about this book, uh, Judging Dread, Examining the World of Judge Dread, uh, which is out from uh, from Secart, and uh, we are joined by uh, Scott Weatherly, who's the uh, uh, editor and has written one of the essays as well. Hello, Scott. Hi, how are you doing? Yes, yes, uh, editor, contributor, and. Uh... Uh, yeah, I was painting painting Julian's butt whilst I was doing it as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, we've got uh, Julian Darius, who not only is a contributor to the book, but is also uh, one of the brains behind uh, the publisher's Secart. Yeah, welcome. It's an honor to be here. Excellent, and uh, we've also got uh, Tony Farina, uh, who's uh, written one of the essays in, in the book. Hi, Tony. Hello, hello. Thanks. This is so. Insane. I told people that we've been invited on and they were like, what now? What's happening? So it's very cool. Thanks for having us, Mike. No worries. No worries. I, I genuinely get so little feedback about the podcast. I, I, quite often it's just like just broadcasting it into the ether and just going, well, okay, well, I'll do the next episode then. So I never, I never, <laughs> I never think that people actually might listen to it. Um, anyway, so we, we, we're here to talk about, about judging dread because, um, so this is, this is just out from Sekar and it's a, a, a well, you know what, Scott, you yes. explain <laughs> what, what this book is before I put words into your mouth. Uh, well, uh, to be fair, what, what it is is it's a it's a collection of essays. Wait a minute. 
dog. Right, so it's a collection of essays uh, from uh, a number of contributors all over the world, actually. We've got some fantastic guys. Uh, I put an open uh, thing out to uh, contributors. We've got guys from uh, America, Europe, uh, Bangladesh. Uh, all, it's, it's a fantastically diverse uh, cast of people, all providing an angle and an, an analysis on an element of Judge Dredd and his wider world. Um, and I mean, not to put words in Julian's mouth, but really the sort of the objective of Sequat and the books is to provide sort of an acce- accessible but sort of academic a- analysis on comics, uh, and that's sort of what we try to do. Um, I will say, I'm not an academic. Um, I'm, uh, you know, basically like yourself, a roving podcaster that sort of was allowed to do this. And um, so it's not a dry academic sort of like scholarly piece. It's designed for fans to try and get a different approach on it. So that's sort of what it is. Um, uh, but what it came out of was literally me saying, well, there's not a book in Sequoia about Judge Dredd. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Julian, uh, when um, when Scott said that, what was your what was your initial reaction? Well, Scott's my butt, so <laughs> my initial reaction was, "Hell yes! How do we make this work?" And I'm a lifelong 2000 AD fan, uh, and, and Judge Dredd in particular. And you know, I wanted to say that you know, 2000 AD uh, was super important to me. Um, especially as a kid, being a kid in the 80s and an adolescent in the 90s, uh, a very conformist time, maybe not quite as bad as Thatcher, but a pretty oppressive time for me. Um, You know, having these odd little 2000 AD collections in the back of comic stores were like a glimpse into another world that uh, was so exciting for me. So making sure that a Brit was the editor you know, and nobody else could do it but Scott. <laughs> well, I, I guess we'll, I, we'll come on to talk about uh, the, the 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 culture surrounding Judge Dredd and, and, and mm. everything um, in a minute. Uh, Tony, when uh, I, I, I'm presuming, and again, to put words into your mouth, that you Please saw do. the shout out for essays, and this is something that you that you decided to, uh, uh, to to get involved with. Is 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 that how it worked? Yeah, so Scott, so my show, I've got a show, uh, Indie Comics Spotlight, it's called, and Scott was on uh, early on when I first started it about a year and a half ago now. Um, I had Scott on as the Dread guy. I was like, I'm doing Dread. There's one person I need. And I knew, I didn't know Scott yet. I had just listened to a show. I was a fan. And um, I'm like, well, this is the guy. So I reached out to him and um, it was great because I was kind of a Dread novice, as it were. I didn't grow up with it. Like for me, the indie comics I read were more like Eclipse and Parody Press and stuff like that, like, you know, American kind of counterculture stuff. Um, but I knew it, you know, I had read America because I, you, I mean, I don't know how you don't read that. And um, so, so I knew enough to get in trouble, the IDW uh, run. So when Scott put that out after having the great chat with him, I was like, done. I mean, um, <laughs> Days of Chaos is, is my focus. And that was actually when I, I read fresh for this one. I had not read that yet. But once I was like, this is this is the storyline that I find fascinating. So when he put that out, I was like, I'm going to start digging in um, to that whole kind of privacy thing. Because, you know, I live in America where we're always under surveillance. So I, it just was a no brainer. So I was just thrilled. I pitched it to him. It I know it, it morphed a little from what I originally pitched to what it ended once I actually read, you know, Days of Chaos four times. Uh, but I think it came out. I think it came out okay. Hmm. I, I guess the the, the 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 initial question that that needs asking is um, why why do you guys think that uh, Judge Dredd as a character as a as a comic book is worthy of being examined? Because it's it's always that that, that thing when, when whenever um, you know I see comics criticism online or I I go off on one in the pub. Um, there's, there's always that little voice that, that, that says, you know, it's, it's just, it's just comic books. Why, you know, why, why are you reading so much into this? What, what, what's your guys take on that? To be fair, I'll, I'll hand off to Julian first because of why he created Sequoia, to be fair, for this very purpose. <clears throat> and then I'll, I'll give, you know, the dread answer, but I think, you know, Julian, I will hand off to you first being there, uh, you know, from the sequel angle. <laughs> well, you're very kind, Scott. Um, you know, I mean, I, the whole point of Sequart, founded in the 90s, was 
to say that comics can be as moving and as important and as complex as the art in any other medium, um, which is something that I passionately believe and I still believe. Um, Judge Dredd has not only the longevity, but the depth of stories, stories that I'm sure have moved all four of us. I've cried at Judge Dredd. I've been angry at Judge Dredd. Um, and between him and his wider world, you can do anything with that universe. And there have been just decades of Titanic creators, people who we all admire, people who could stand up to the work in any other medium who have worked on this evolving epic, the sprawling, you know, uh, multiverse of stories. Um, so to me, you know, it's a, it's a no brainer. I mean, uh, Judge Dredd is of that caliber and can stand alongside Batman or anybody else. Yeah. I think, I think from, from my point of view, I think for Dredd in particular, I mean, you know, um, like, like I came on Sequoia, I sort of met, you know, Julian through sort of some of the books and, and, and we've become friends and, and through that. And so comic criticism and, and analysis has been fascinating to me to learn more about it and the ways and the means of it. But I grew up with dread, much like these guys. You know, I'm, I'm a typical brick kid. I started on the Beano and the Dandy. And then when I got to a point where I was like, you know, these aren't violent enough. I want something else. Uh, I, I came across, uh, and it's in the introduction, I came across uh, the complete Judge Dredd as the, uh, you know, the reprinting. And I sort of came across uh, the Cursed Earth saga. And when I came across it, and then and I was introduced sort of to late, late 80s, 89, 90, sort of, I got into 2018 and, and from there. And when I was a kid, it's it's very much sort of like, you know, oh, this is amazing. It's, you know, you the 2000s in particular, you have all the characters and they got the sort of like, it could be done as, just read as a pulpy sci-fi anthology. And it, I, I enjoyed it as such. And then as I've got older, I'm able to go back now and look at it and go, yeah, th th this actually like John Wagner was, uh, you know, was doing, a, you know, important work really from, from a critical and satirical point of view, you know, and it made me laugh at sort of looking at this as especially like people hold up like RoboCop as as a as a, a you know a satire of eighties corporate culture and you know tech um, you know demand and I'm like yeah but Judge Dredd was doing that before <laughs> and in some cases much better as, as Julian said it's forty four years plus forty plus years now of stories um, you know satirizing different parts of British, American or world culture. Um, and some of it's some of the best satire to read because you don't have to read it as satire. If you want to read it as satire, it is there. And some of it is cutting, but also you can enjoy the stories as, you know, a pulp, dark comic adventure series. Yeah. And for me coming at it, like as a somebody who, like I'm always, I t used to teach literary criticism. It's something that is important to me. Like just as a person, I'm always trying to see things through, through that lens. And I, I believe that what Julian said is true, that all forms of art are, you know, they have their, their valid. And that for somebody to say to you, like, why are you spending all your time reading these comic books? It's like, well, it's because you haven't read one. And that's, that would always just be the answer I would say to anybody. Um, well, how, why are you wasting your time with fill in the blank? Generally, that means whoever's saying that doesn't understand the thing and doesn't want to take the time to understand the thing. And so that, so to me, the idea of writing about Dread in particular is because unlike other comics, and I love comics, I've been a comic fan pretty much my whole life, but there's the biggest thing that you always struggle with is continuity. There's continuity here. The thing that they did that they just, that Wagner, uh, man, He's aged in real time. And so, yeah, they've done a few things to, to make, to keep him around, but you don't have to worry about continuity in this. And I think that makes the most interesting and most compelling story because you can go back to something that was 20 years ago and it's there and you don't have to say, wait, which earth was this on and which time was this and who, which Batman was this? And is this, it's, it's this thing. And so the, the, the commentary gets to continue on, but it can also work as its own historical record. So there's a history of Mega City One that also exists. And so to me, there's very few things in the history of art, of, of modern art, that is that has that kind of well that you can go back to over and over because it has its own history. I'm sure there is a history of Mega City One that exists and it's real where you, there's no history of Gotham, there's no history of Metropolis, those have all changed. 
So I think to me, that's what makes it this story in particular, but comic books in general, very compelling is because there are always commentaries. But the reason this works is because when I started writing, I was like, oh, well, I could just go back. I mean, I'm, I'm writing Days of Chaos. I found something to pull from, you know, Prague 6. And it was still in canon. So it's brilliant. It's just brilliant, amazing, thoughtful work that that takes an army of people to keep going. So there's tons of validity there. One of the, just to, to build on that, you know, I loved all the essays. So, you know, the, you know no, there was no favorites. But one of, one all of the my essays, children are brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very when, true. When, when, once he's off camera, then then we'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but one one of the essays that was most interesting to discuss, actually, you've said it was about this. Uh, I'm going to find it. We wrote it out because it's on there. But it was it's called um, how how to, to that, or something like that, how Mega City humanizes its characters through that continuity. You know, uh, it's, it was basically sort of like how we huge not humanize them through death. And so um, I am going to sort of name check because I'm going. I should really do that. Um, here you go. I'm just going to check in the bibliography. So here you go. Better living through death by Santiago Mayad. So it was it was in that discussion that we had because we were trying to give it that that comparison piece because we were sort of we were using Rob Williams uh, Hershey uh, recent you know uh, book two recently finished as our sort of baseline to say here's a character that was introduced you know in the Judge Shell quest. It's way, way in the beginning and has literally grown to join the Council of Five. She's become a, a confidant of dread. She became, you know, chief judge several times. And now she's having this sort of epilogue story. And they've, they've aged her like dread. Like, you know, she's had, the, they've taken away the drugs and the medicine and now she's aging and stuff. And it was this sort of thing. And we were saying, well, that's actually really powerful that these characters have, have a life. You know, more so than any other character. I mean, we, we sort of we built a comparison to, um, you know, like Batman and Nightwing and, and, you know, Red Hood. Yeah, Batman's now had this many, you know, Robins. And if you really want to sort of do it, as you were saying, sort of, you know, Tony, the, the history of Gotham's had to change. He's had them all in six months. You know, at one point, like all those Robins appeared between June and Jan, you know, June and the next J- January in order to fit them all in. Maybe... You can say, yeah, it's now, was it 2144, 2143? But her, she was introduced in 21 whatever. And then she's had this life. Like she has had an existence and characters have died. You know? And so it is, having this continuity and the, thing, the fact that things have an impact, like the fact that the Apocalypse War is still like had an impact. Day of Chaos, I'm sure will come back in you know 10 years. It'll still have an impact. Characters come and go. You know, it's not, Characters can be pulled back, or not from the dead, but like come in and they do because they're working in different parts of the city or whatever. It's just such a fantastic um, web of existence. Like it literally feels like another existence you can step into and go, yeah, I'm going to go back to this period. And, you know, it, it just exists. And I just find that fascinating. And that was one of the things that drove this book was you can go, right, we're going to have a look at it from this angle. We're going to have a look at going footsie. So here's how living in Mega City One affects you. We're going to go back and look at all the different things from the stories around Boeing or the League of Fatties or all these other things. That's funny, but they're actually dealing with mental health. Like, you know, you look at the start of um, the Chopper, and it's the first Chopper series. Chopper's mum, her hobby is washing dishes, then she dirties them to wash them again. Like that's the thing she does to fill her time. And so you have all these little quirks and stuff in this living environment. It's more than any other comic world, it feels alive. And I think that's one of the most fascinating things around Mega City One. One of the things we, we, we should talk about, particularly as we have Americans uh, on, uh, on this chat, is... Um, about this this this, this, this perspective because as you say scott you know there's, there's people from all over the world who's, who've contributed to, to to this book um it's 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 the hoary old thing of what well, americans don't do satire they don't do irony mm-hmm. um they don't get they don't get judge dread but one thing that the the going to your shows talking to a lot of americans even doing panels like the the, the ones that i've done at san diego and, and new york comic-con has taught me is that that's absolute bollocks but what what is what it seems to me to be based on is the fact that most americans um experience of judge dread is the 1995 movie or even you know the 2012 movie which whichever one 
don't have that rich storytelling. Once they actually encounter the the comic, they have they absolutely get it. But uh, Julian, Tony, I want to get your perspective on this and 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 about the the Britishness of dread and and whether that's part of the appeal, whether it gets in the way. You know, what 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 what's um, what's your take? Before okay, well, for me, I always find it fascinating when outsiders look in. And so some of like my go-to news for American news is very rarely inside. Like I read the guardian, you know, I like, I like seeing what is somebody else saying, because I think you, you have, you have no interest other than telling the truth. And so satire tells the truth. Um, it doesn't always have to be a joke. It just has to be the truth and it has to, you know, point it, point the mirror back at you. So the reason I like Dread so much, the reason I think Mega City One is fascinating and why I want a Mega City One series, you know, as a show, because I want to see, I mean, Dread should be in it, of course, but I just want to see these other lives that are living. What I find fascinating, I don't think the Britishness gets in the way because I think it can tell the story in an honest way. Um, the thing that I compare Dread the most to, uh, which is a book that is one of, I think, one of the best written American satires about war is Catch-22. Um, and that's American looking at American war and the hypocrisy and nonsense of it. And most people hate that book. It's so honest and it's so real and it's painful and it's beautiful for all of those reasons. So for me, I think it's Heller notwithstanding. There's a few other American satirists who do it well. I think for the most part, we need an outside perspective for, for us to actually be able to see ourselves. So I don't think it gets in the way. I think it only enhances the reality of the situation on the ground. I think if there's one way that Americans struggle with dread is that we are programmed to identify with the protagonist, no matter how, what sins he commits, right? So, I mean, if, if he has created the villain, if he winds up shooting civilians, you know, we're going to get like some sense of catharsis in that Hollywood movie. And then, you know, we are programmed to understand, oh, good, good job, white guy. You know, you've apologized. It's all good. You're the hero again. And especially in mainstream American culture, we struggle with, uh, as Americans, the concept that you can have an unlikable protagonist. I mean, obviously, you know, indie stuff does this all the time. And I, I don't think this is constitutionally a flaw in Americans, but our culture constantly pushes this uh, agenda. And so I think given that the sort of dominant American response to uh, Robocop is, yeah, he's badass, right? Um, there are people who just don't get that there's satire there. And, and I think the same thing is true for Dread. Um, but that's not to say that plenty of Americans don't get it. I mean, I think growing up, I got it and I just assumed everybody knew, yeah, this would not be enjoyable. This is not okay. You're supposed to have questions. You're supposed to question your heroes. Um, that's a lot healthier. Um, but the flip side of that is that I assumed Britain always questioned its heroes and that's not true either. <laughs> No, <laughs> not at all. In fact, <laughs> the last few years have taught us anything. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's on that point that I, I, I did want to, to, to get everyone's perspective because uh, the last few years have been very interesting. Um, and thinking about, uh, you know, not, not even just the, the, the last 18 months um, and, and, and seeing people's differing reactions to... Um, power structure oh, and hierarchy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, but, but also the bro broader attitudes to, 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 to the to, to the police. Do, do you think that's partly a stumbling block? That the, uh, certainly culturally, a policeman in America is very different, perceived very differently to a policeman in in Britain. I was going to think admit, so. I would say one of the things that's been interesting doing this, and also like. We, we kicked off doing this book with initial conversations and stuff, you know, me and Julian and I started reaching out and I got like, Tony and all the others. And then we had sort of, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests and then the police and then there was the reaction from the police. And in my head, and not, well, Julian and I had this conversation at one point, we're like, is this the right time to be putting out a dread book? Like, you know, I don't want us to be, think I don't want them to think we are 
um, glamorizing. Like I want them to. You know, the, the, the book it's called Judging Dread. Like we are literally judging his, you know, him. Um, and so you know, with everything that's gone on with this sort of like you know, the, the, the police brutality and you know, the Blue Lives Matter and all this other stuff, it was very sort of like I want to be clear about how we're approaching this character. Like the, the essays do. There is an essay in there about the Cursed Earth saga and about that transition of him being a hero to being a you know, or presented almost as a hero to them being presented almost as that sort of like strong fascist thing. But one of the things that came out bizarrely as I was, we were doing this in through discussions and stuff is, or at least this is in my opinion, is Americans love a cowboy and Dread is not a cowboy. You know, when you look at these sort of like, you know, Dirty Harry, you know, uh, rigs out of, you know, Lethal Weapon or, um, you know, all the action heroes of sort of like Cobra, you know, I can name a bunch from the sort of like, you know, uh, all those Chuck Norris, Sylvester, and all those sort of characters, they're very cowboys, they're very Wild West. And Dread is like, no, 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 I am, I am the law. Like, I am authority and I follow the rules, you know, and that sort of thing. And I think part of it is that, 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 that it's not the, um, he, he's not the sort of the rogue element. You know, he's not the loose cannon that gets shouted at by his captain. Like, you know, he is the authority. The authority. He literally wrote that. You know, the, what's it called? Like his his book of the law, the uh, comportment of, of of what it is to be a judge. So he's almost like the antithesis of the American cowboy cop. Um, and uh, you know, so I find that fascinating as well. That sort of he he just doesn't fit that mold of what the the, the Western hero should be. Yeah, I agree. The thing about that, too, is because the Black Lives Matter stuff came up in my essay a little bit, too, because mm. I'm writing about Days of Chaos and the the argument that Wagner was essentially warning us like, hey, there's a, there's there's two sides of this. Like when you, when you look in the Days of Chaos series uh, saga, what happens is, is the people rise up and they rebel and it's pushed down like that. But they they go from protesting. There's this difference between protesting and speaking up and then chaos and you know looting and rioting and like going from i'm standing up for my rights and i'm going to stand in the street and i'm going to shout and yell and say damn you fascists then you're like oh now i'm going to break windows and steal shit and so i actually address that in my essay because i think what's the, the black lives matter movement is this positive protest thing and then what happens is, is you have people who are saying you know let's smash windows and steal stuff and 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 then people are going well What's the moral ambiguity there? Is that okay? Is that, and then what are the police allowed to do? So, so I, I wanted to address it directly because I think that's right, is that, is that you're like, well, if a cop goes in, if there's a protest and somebody starts breaking windows, a cop should probably show up and say, hey, the guy who owns that sporting goods store, you're not mad at him. Why are you taking his, why are you taking his bats? Why are you smashing his window? You know, so, so I think what, where Dread would, of course, go in and shoot them all. <laughs> for, for taking the bats, not just and so so I think that's the that's the thing that we struggle with is like the the difference between enforcing the law like enforcing a law with reason as opposed to doing it the way that dread does it enforcing the law with impunity and so people don't get that either um, and they should but that's that's why this book is important because we need to have the conversation there's a difference between you know using your head and dread, dread doesn't use his head. If it's if the law changes, he will completely, uh, you know, enforce the law completely 180. There's the one early on, remember, where he's like on vacation and he's walking through the streets and and he's not like people are committing crimes and he's just walking past them because he's technically off duty or he had been suspended temporarily. And then as soon as he's back on, he's like, you know, bust an ass because, again, for him, the, the written rules are the only thing that matters. And um, in America, you know, those things, the written rules change from state to state, of course. You know, Julie and I live in different states, so we have different state laws. My governor just signed it. This is totally true. My governor just signed a law that if you feel threatened by a group of three or more people, you can drive your car over them. And, you know, that's going to happen. And that will be the law. So it's just such uh, an interesting America, <laughs> America. for free. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I'm fully expecting yeah. Tony to be the, the, the Florida man runs over three people. Oh my God. I, <laughs> uh, I don't even leave the house most days. <laughs> well, I mean, I just want to say that, you know, I, I think the point is very mel well made that Judge Dredd is not rogue cop, you know, um, he's not that guy. Um, but also we're talking about sort of cultural stereotypes. And, and just as we were talking, you know, earlier about, um, 
you know, America versus Britain. I mean, these are sort of stereotypes. Um, I live within an hour uh, away from Ferguson and I went to Ferguson. Um, so, you know, the majority of Americans actually side with Black Lives Matter. And, you know, we, we are programmed to sort of like worship authority and, you know, sir and officer and, and all of that. But the flip side of that is that, you know, you look at polls and even when Giuliani is speaking at the convention in 2016, he says, you know, when uh, if a cop gets out of line, he should be punished. On the other hand, if he hasn't done anything wrong, he should. It's like that's the Black Lives Matter position, actually, is that there should be a mechanism to punish that. So even when and I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn, even when the bad guys get up and try to justify you know, cracking down and breaking heads, they do it through a language that seems to affirm there's no real reason to protest. We're already, you know, handling that. So it is true that we live in a culture in which, um, you know, people are a little more disposable. Um, I mean, going back to like even Kent State, the majority of Americans when polled were in favor of shooting those kids um, by a slim majority. But that's changed now. So, I mean, our culture is conflicted. We, we do have a society in which, you know, we seem comfortable saying uh, if you can't afford cancer treatment, your job is to die. You know, sorry, bud. Um, but the flip side is that most Americans don't agree with that. So I think these these generalizations are, you know, more complex on the ground. Scott, what's, what's your thoughts? Me or Scott? I didn't hear who said. Sorry. Scott. Just in general. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I agree. I, I think that that's true. I think that um, I think that is what what makes dread everything that Julian just said is so true, and that's what makes dread harder to read is because because there's no there's no gray areas there. He only has one way. He and 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 so how can you like somebody who never says I'm wrong? How do you how do you get behind somebody who never? Um, Scott, when Scott and I first talked about dread, I mean, you know, he is a fascist. You're not supposed to like him. Like it stresses me out if somebody who's got an eye on the law shirt on and is wearing it on ironically a little bit, not like as a love letter to dread, not like as a love letter to 2000 AD and the whole idea, but like, no, dread is right. Dread is the law. You're like, dude, all right, I'm going to go away from you yeah. now because your, your other shirt under that says Rorschach was right. And so you're stressing yeah. me out. Um, <laughs> You know, so so I definitely think we 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 struggle sometimes dealing with um, uh, with with it. This thing of things like say this this idea though, you've, cause the, the idea of Rorschach is, is you know is totally right. This idea of an oh yeah, Rorschach's badass, like he's that cool character. And you know, there's a quote from Alan Moore that's like you know when he's at conventions, the first person to say to him sort of like you know oh Rorschach's the one I love. He'll just walk away. It's like no, no I'm not <laughs> I'm not having that conversation because you've clearly not understood it. But it's the same as like you know they say when the police start using the Punisher symbol. And you're sort of like, you don't, you, 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 you clearly haven't read, but you don't understand what it is you're representing. Like, you know, you, you, you know, it's, it's not, you know, you're not playing it right. But I mean, if you think like in the, in like the small house, like Judge Smiley calls him out, like, you know, um, you know, he's like, no, we're fascists and we are in control and this is what we do. Like you're a blunt instrument. Like I'm thinking strategically and I'm, I'm trying to manage this mass of people and the way it's running and you're out there cracking heads. You know, who's actually thinking about the future? Who's really thinking about the people? Um, but what, what I think is I would say, I would, I would sort of push back on what Tony says. I think, you, you know, the, in general, there's a generalisation that dread is very black and white. But, you know, that's not wholly true. I mean, granted, he's had like 44 years of, of character progression. Of course. More than, say, any other character, really. But there's, there's, there has been moments when he, yeah, we, we know he has stopped and considered, you know, letters to a Democrat and, and you know, he left. He, he, you know, he went off and became, went to the, uh, to the cursed earth. And even now, like, you know, um, Dredd is more willing to see other perspectives as he gets older uh, from whether it be democracy or uh, muty rights or the use of, robot judges or whatever like you know he's he's but that's taken and again going back to this idea of continuity it's taken him 44 years to to shift his 
character to shift his position. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, like a 90 minute movie of like, you know, here's my story. I can by the end of it, I'm redeemed. And I now see everybody's point. It's like, no, he's a stubborn old bastard and he is going to sort of, you know, have his position. However, again, to what you said, Tony, there'll be days when like, you know, it, he might stand up for muty rights and he will protect or stop a group of, um, you know, cursed earth refugees from being shot at or being sort of like, you know, attacked. And then on the way home, someone's going to drop drop a Sinti calf bar and he'll beat the crap out of them. <laughs> so, yeah, it swings around about. But, you know, he, he is a developing character. And so there's this thing, that there, is the, there is the grey, or there's the growing grey in Dread. And I think sort of as he gets older, I think that creeps in more and more. I think you see it more. And I think Rob Williams has really brought it in, as, as has Wagner. But, um, I, that, again, that's something I find fascinating that, you know, we, I think we do as, as a developing person. You should, you should start to question things, and we should start to question our place in the universe and, or you know, in in life. And um, but it, weirdly, I see, you know, it's that thing again. Sorry to go on, but we keep hearing this thing of like, you know, I don't like politics in my comics. You know, I don't like it that Captain America's become political. I don't like that Judge Dredd's become political. And you sort of go, um, I don't think you read the same Dredd that I was reading in the sort of like in the eighties and nineties. <laughs> And, you know, you, as I say, you can read it as the pulps, but it's always been there. And now it's becoming a little bit, in times like this, it just seems to become when you are living through those times and you are more aware of the sort of the, the political and the social climate, it just becomes a bit more, more, more obvious. I mean, I was born in 1981. You know, I wasn't around for like, you know, or I wasn't sort of conscious of like the bricks and riots and the sort of like you know thatcher's influence i was just concerned she was taking my milk away you know I was, that was my concern and then but when you look back on it you have to understand the time in which those stories are being told and so when you get younger people going well it was just it was dread being dread no it was a reflection of the times and i, I weirdly i find that this time has been useful to, to for dread to be more relevant um so, yeah, I think, I think, you know, I think from an American, I think the Americans do get it. I think yeah, these, these two sort of represent that. But I also think sometimes he, the, the times can represent him better than others. You know, in times of sort of peace or, or quieter times, I think sort of like the satire sort of, you know, isn't as cutting, maybe. I just want to briefly second that notion that Dredd is more complex than we sometimes make him out to be. That, you know, I mean, he was he insisted on a vote of putting the judge system up for a referendum. You know, um, people didn't turn out, but he <laughs> insisted on that uh, and he lets people off all the time. I mean, he we see a sort of uh, prosecutorial discretion, if you will, uh, used all the time. Um, and yeah, sometimes he's a hard nose, but but I don't know that I hate Judge Dredd. I mean, I kind of like him and, you know, but he seems to have a kind of version of a conservative mentality that's like, OK, look, if the law isn't fair, change the law. You know, I'm here to enforce the law, um, you know, and, and I can understand that. It doesn't account for our broken politics and, you know, it's not my mentality, but it's not necessarily he's not an evil man, you know. No, I don't think he's evil either. I think what what right what you just said is exactly right, Julian. Because it's like when the one the one that I keep coming back to, I always just because I love that that issue. I wish I remember which prog it was, where he's like like strolling through town and they almost draw him almost with a smile on his face because he's like off duty, as it were. And it was like such an interesting look at this is how like the rule says I'm off, so therefore I'm not gonna I'm not gonna force law. See crime happen. I don't care, citizen, moving along kind of thing. But then as soon as he's back on duty, then he is, he is that. And I think, I think you're right that there is, that there's, there's something about somebody who, who it, it, he, there, he's, he knows who he is and right. If the law is unjust, let's change the law. But until you do, that's the law and I'm the law and I have to, I have to enforce it. And so it's not as though he's saying don't change or don't move. And I think what we see with Days of Chaos in particular, you know, that was the chickens coming home to roost, right? Because he's the one who made the decision in the first place to blow everything up in Europe, which is what leads to Days of Chaos, whatever it was 20 years later. And so he's, at the end of that, he's changed because he's like, oh, well, I made the total black and white. I made the right decision then. I don't think he regrets making that decision, but he's like, oh, 
actions have consequences in a way that I didn't really think of before. And so because, as you mentioned earlier, Scott, how human he is and how human everybody in Mega City One is, is that gives him an opportunity as a grumpy old man to be like, well, well maybe I can still learn something. So it is, it is an interesting um, look at it. And it makes the concept like in our country too, you know, the word phrase, Julian, you know, the phrase law and order coined by Nixon means something different than it means written down. Like law and order, you're like, yeah, we're all pro law and order. Who wouldn't be for that? Like you said earlier, it's the language you use, but the way that Nixon used it, the way that Giuliani used it, it means something different. Um, and and it and the way that Dredd uses it is the way that normal people think law and order means. This is the law. I am the order. I'm going to follow the law. And that's that. So he is right. I mean, I don't necessarily say that I like him. I don't hate him, but I wouldn't I wouldn't invite him over for tea anytime. Yeah. Soon, I would say. Isn't that the, 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 the central point, though, that um, it's all very well to say, well, don't break the law and you won't get hurt. But the law in Mega City One is designed to create lawbreakers by making it so physically impossible. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's several stories. Um, I'm thinking not just in 2000 AD, but also in the Daily Star um, newspaper strips where uh, Dredd um, stops somebody and, you know, checks up on them with control. And it comes back and, and it says, oh, you know, you've got yourself a model citizen there. And there's always that element of, well, I'm sure there's some around. The, the whole process of living in Mega City, when it's designed to make you a criminal. Yeah. So is, isn't, isn't that the satire, the, 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 the arbitrariness of the power of the policeman and of the law is that it doesn't matter how good you are and careful you are, the system is going to criminalize you. And it, it, for, for, for me, that's, that's uh, you know, even, even before the, the, um, the last 18 months or, or two years, that was something that um, I'd, I'd read some stuff about with, with you know, Black Lives Matter, the, 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 the experience of um, a black person living in Britain and, and America is one of arbitrary harassment and persecution. So to 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 a certain extent, it, it's kind of. Do you not think that the the law is an ex, is the excuse when he says I I am the law? He's the one in charge of making the law. You know the judges. It, it's 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 all very well to say we well, don't don't break the law, but literally the police enforcing them are the ones who were setting them in the first place. Yeah, it, I, I get you mean it, it's almost like, yeah you're, you're set up to fail as a citizen of Mega City One. I mean, you know, uh, you get random. Um, you know, crime raids where they'll just turn up at your, you know, your flat or your, you know, your apartment, and then they'll they'll raid for everything. And if you, you know, they find you've got some sort of like sugar synth or some, you know, coffee substitute or something else, all of a sudden you're off to the cubes for something as ridiculous as that. And it might be yours, it could be the previous tenants doesn't catch in your apartment. Yeah, you are set up to fail. Um, and uh, the things are there's a cool. I remember there's an issue where Dred's getting a physical. And there's a comment in that that's basically sort of like, yeah, he's fine, you know, we're using these drugs to keep him young and he's got the body of a whatever you're old, you know, da, da, da. But then they're like, and they're like, well, what about psychologically? And they're basically like, just be grateful he's on our side and he's got a structure to work in because he's basically a savage. Well, there's, yeah. there's um, Alone in the Crowd, mm. uh, that, that classic Steve Dillon story where, you know, it, it draws a direct, direct line between the power of the judge and the power of the criminal. They do, they're behaving the same way. And the, the citizens are terrified. And, I, you know, that, that always struck me as being a, a very clear um, message from, from, from Wagner and Grant. You know, this, the, the, these two things are two sides of the coin. One is not light and, and the other darkness. It's, it's they're, they're employing the same kind of power with people, you know? Yeah, oh, totally. That's totally true. I think that, I think what's really, what, what, what happens is, is that you, you create a power structure. You, I mean, you're saying it's like the two sides of the same coin, but it's, it's based on a power structure that, that you know, you're, if you're the tail side, as it were, if you're the citizen side, it's, it's that if you're stuck in Rosengrantz and Guildenstern or dead, it's always going to come up heads no matter what you do. So it, the power structure is, is it looks like it's two sides of the same coin, but you can never win. You're never going to win the coin toss because the odds are always against you. Because like you said, not only are you enforcing them, but you're enacting them. And yeah, you have no idea um, when you're going to be breaking a law. And you think about in our country, the amount of people who were incarcerated during the three strikes and you're, I don't know if you guys know what the three strikes and you're out rule is, is if it was like just basic, just people like had a dime bag or whatever, 
three of those, you're in jail for 20 years. There are people who are just getting out of jail, spent 20 years nonviolent criminals for something that is currently legal in most states. But our, those people weren't released. You know, like they, they were just kept because it's like, well, at the time it was the law. So even though now we've made that legal, you broke, you did something that at the time was illegal that didn't harm anyone but yourself, you're still in jail. And so uh, we definitely have created a system where you know, just living your life is going to be criminal for sure. I also think, say, you know, from my experience, you know, you've got your experience, but from my experience as well, it, 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 you know, to sort of think this idea of what you're saying, Michael, is like, the government's reaction to Scott Taylor's satire, especially when I was a kid, is like anything that the government didn't like, they just criminalised. You know, to, to put it in the most sort of like silly of terms, is like, you know, the video nasties. Don't like these films, they're banned. And if you're found with them, you can do time. You could literally do, and like, you know, they became like a contraband of video cassettes. And, people, and video shops were raided to find these things, to find, you know, zombie holocaust, even like the you know, evil dead, like films that are readily available now on 4K Blu-ray from somewhere. And, and so there is this is instant, like you say, it's it's not, you know, you're set up to fail, but also it's almost like the instant response of uh, something's created, we're not sure how to deal with this, so we're going to criminalise it because it makes it easier to sort of manage. And basically if the law, the law is, you don't do it. And if you found doing it, well, it's the law, then you, you, you're a criminal. So it, it, it's almost like it's not only they set up to fail, it's almost like a an easy response. It's a lazy response. Like, yeah, the, the, and the thing about the Mega City One is it's they're not going to look at the social consequences or even the social um, implications or the social, they're not going to look at the brute cause. They're just like, oh, well, we, we don't want, you know, candy, so, some, you know, Otto sums candy and all this other stuff. Like, no, it's, it's got these effects, get rid of it. Okay, it's now criminalised. Well, I mean, we, 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 we come to the root then of, of the whole law and order uh, agenda that, you know, Nick, we've already named uh, Nixon, but of course LBJ um, had his own war on uh, war on crime, <laughs> war on poverty, then Nixon came along with the war on drugs. Um, and it, 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 it's that, uh, the simplicity of, well, there's a problem, so there must be a solution, and the solution is probably going to be hitting it. And Reagan, who of course was um, governor of California during the uh, the Berkeley uh, University protests, um, you know that that was that was his responsibility. And then he becomes president. But one one, one thing I'm, I've been reading a lot of recently is about um, uh, the broken windows policies of of um, uh, uh, James Q. Wilson, who of course. Uh, Dread preceded <laughs> uh, Wilson's uh, um, main theory by by a number of years, uh, but it's that it's that you, you can see it reflected that notion of um, so those who don't know broken windows is where uh, it's the idea that um, a single broken window in a neighbourhood is an indication that the neighbourhood is unprotected by uh, society and the law. And so uh, you it encourages further crime. So you then have a sliding scale upwards. And by and large, it's bollocks. Um, you know, and and there's been lots of work to to to, to, to prove that, 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 that it is, but it, it has such a hold over our imagination. And you know, for me, and I realise running out of time here, and I've gone off on one, but um, dread is a satire of that. It's, it's as if you say the the, the the idea of a simple solution. I've really enjoyed um, this book, which is the, the punitive term. Uh, turn in American life by um, uh, Michael Sherry, because that's that's a history of uh, the, the the law and order narrative and the idea that we have become so punitive now that actually we don't we don't even care if anyone's broken the law, we just want to see them punished. Yeah, um, because it it, make, it makes life simple. Like we don't we, you know we don't have to examine the the social causes of why they've done what they've done. It just oh, just, just hit them with your billy club, mate. You know. Well, it even it comes even at every level. Like you know, you, it's um, what sort of that sort of thing. It was you know, when you're parenting, sort of the, the the ease of punishment before you know against the sort of the the tediousness of teaching your children. You know, if your kid doing something ever again, yes, yeah, I know smacking's not you know is against the law. Like I don't smack my kid, but like that thing of like punishment. All right, I take that away. You know. You know, go to your room. You you know, you, you can't play on your computer game. You can't have your pudding. You can't have this. Do whatever. There's a punishment. And you're not addressing. You're not going, well, actually, 
we're going to educate you. I'm going to tell you why you can't do what you're doing. Like, you know, it's dangerous or, you know, it's, it's, you know, we don't have the resources for you to do that. Or, you know, you can't do this. Whatever. There's no education. It's just, that, that's wrong. And I'm telling you it's wrong. And, you know, go to bed or go to the cubes or go to the, you know, you go, go to the, the cells. Cubes. Yeah. It's, you know what I mean? It, but that's what it is, isn't it? It's this, it's the punitive is, is easy, which is where we end up incarcerating so many people. Unfortunately, and I don't know how it works, you know, I don't think there's ever been a, I can't think of obviously this sort of life in the cubes, like an in cube sort of story, but like, you know, when people do go into prison, it's, it's, it's a known fact that you could go in for a simple crime. And because you spend six months, a year in there associating with other for one better phrase, criminals and other, you know, people in different lives. You come out and you go, yeah, whilst I was in there, I now know this, or I've, you know, I'm, and because I'm, I've now got this on my record, I can't get that job. And so I'm being pushed down into further criminality or I'm pushed into a different situation where I'm going to receive another punitive um, response. And this is, that comes back to this thing you say about, um, there was a really good story recently, actually, of the, you know, the, the ex judge served his time on Titan and was working in the sewers and, Je- and dread was hounding him saying like, well, there's no such thing as a good, as a, re- a redemptive former judge, you know, and he was hounding him. And it's obviously he was a, you know, good judge or whatever, but that's the thing, isn't it? Like, you know, if you're spotted to have a criminal record or you've had some punitive, you know, um, action against you, then it's a stain. And if anything, it's going to push you down a ladder. It's not going to go, well, you've ser- there's no such, there's this crap about I've served my time or you've served your time into society and now you're back into it. No, 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 you've served your time, but that's going to hang around your neck like an albatross for the rest of your life. And that's the real sadness of it. And it, it, that's reflected in, in Mega City One as well. Julian, you, you look like you've got a, a point to make. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just want to, I mean, the, the whole thing about, you know, broken windows also gives the justification, you know, for saying what I did of, you know, well, it's against the law, but also that if you, if you crack down on minor things, those people who you're arresting are, you know, in theory, committing other crimes, right? And so this gives this justification for endless policing. We've talked about Black Lives Matter, but we haven't addressed, uh, especially in terms of the police dynamic, but we haven't addressed race. Um, and I was listening to an interview about Dread recently that said that, you know, Dread is actually uh, really utopian in that you don't see a lot of racism, Uh, you know, for all of the problems of, I see the looking askance, but for (laughs) for all of the problems of Mega City One, you know, you don't have permanent classes uh, of, and a permanent underclass defined, except for like mutants or something, defined by skin color. Um, And so when we're talking about this oppression, you know, when you're talking about this, um, you know, sort of, everybody is a criminal. Um, I mean, that's exactly the dynamic of Ferguson. That's exactly the dynamic of over-policed areas in the United States, where, you know, if police pull me over, you know, it's, do you know you were going over the limit? They give me a ticket or not. In Ferguson, it's, you know, your rims aren't quite right. This isn't quite right. It's, it's exactly that Judge Dredd thing. And then here are these tickets. Now you're in the system. You've got to go to the, not the queues, but you got to go to the courthouse. you got to pay fees. You know, and now you're caught up and then there are, you know, additional citations for And it's a very Judge Dredd like system. Um, And I think that dynamic of the judges looking at everybody as a already a criminal, which you do see over and over again, does reflect that reality, even if it's not directly shot through with with racial dynamics. I mean, there's 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 a word for society that that uh, completely covers over. Uh, all uh, all differences, and, and that's called totalitarianism, yeah. which is is, is, also, is also another <laughs> aspect to, uh, to to Judge Red's system. I, I'm conscious that we're coming to the end of our time, but um, one thing I, I I did want to ask about because we've not we've kind of talked generally as opposed to specifically about the essays that that, that, that you guys have done. Um, I wanted to ask uh, you individually uh, whether uh, doing the essay because obviously you had to have a pitch, you had an idea about what you wanted to, to write about and the, the angle that you wanted to take. I wanted to, to find out whether that process changed your mind or whether there was something surprising that you came across or, or you know, that the, the, perhaps you started arguing yourself out of your original position. Uh, Tony, let's go with you first. Yeah, I will go, yeah. Um, 
because I'm actually going to have to jump off after this. So I appreciate it, Mike. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go before it's over, but I've got work, work lame. But yes, for me, 100 percent, um, as I said, my, the, my original pitch was going to be mostly just about um, the privacy issues and the way that the PSU worked. And as I started digging in, which is, again, brilliant, that the PSU is way back, you know, Judge, Judge Jura is way back, like, you know, the, or Judge Edgar from like Prague six. It's insane. So for me, it's um, when I started that way, thinking that's what I'm going to do. I'm only going to focus on uh, the PSU. And as I started to understand this, like warning that Wagner was giving us and the way that we interact with ourselves online and then like, how do how do we how does something simple like I'm just going to talk about privacy really turn into like, how do we rebel? How do we react to a to a fascist system? So it, it made me look at at not only just the story I wanted to tell evolved completely, but then like myself and I can bring some of that into my classroom and some of the conversations we have. It's like, well, you know, how can one small germ of an idea become something else? And and what I really thought mostly most about, I know this makes no sense, but was the difference between protesting and rebelling because because I think days of chaos really, really without using either of those words, it's right there. Some of the people just want to, some of the people are just depressed and they just want to protest. And they just want to say, quit treating me like shit. And some people are like, let's just go burn everything to the ground. And so I wasn't expecting that I would leave writing this essay, having really deep thoughts about the difference between a protest and a rebellion and which one would I prefer to see? I still don't have a good answer, but at least it made me thinking about it. Cool. Uh, uh, Julian, what, what, what about yours? Because you, you, um, uh, you were about the uh, the dark judges, didn't you? Yes, I got the I got you know the best subject in the world, uh, Judge Death. I mean, how can you not be in love with uh, Judge Death as a villain? Um, I think for me, you know, what was surprising because I reread um, virtually every Judge Death appearance, um, and I think what was surprising for me was how I had remembered all those early stories as just unmitigated classics. And then, you know, there were things that I didn't know that I wanted to return to uh, in the in-between years. And for me, what I found was, you know, the, even those, those early stories are, uh, you know, brilliant. I still love them. They've got such, um, you know, they set up so much, but they also have clunky elements and you see the evolution of the strip. And then some of those later stories have brilliant ideas that even if it doesn't quite come off or I'm not as much of a fan of it in comparison, there's so much creativity there. And so for me, seeing that evolution played out and seeing ideas that um, become so important to these characters introduced in a story that might not work completely, I think really illustrated for me how... 2000 AD has let these characters evolve and through all of these iterations and all of these new brains coming and trying to do another take, um, it, it reveals things about the characters and little bits get brought forward and transformed into new elements that we can't imagine the stuff without. Because it, it was one of the things I, I, I've not actually got to your essay yet, I'm afraid. I'm slowly, I've got so much of my own reading to do. I'm only slowly working my way through the essays, but um uh, one thing that's always fascinated me about death is is the kind of un the the hinted at the, the the implied element of well this is what you end up with with Dredd's logic like this is the this is the logical endpoint of Judge Dredd you know and and he's, he's presented as a, as a as an extreme as a, as a as a contrast to Dredd himself but actually you follow through. That's where you <laughs> that's where you end up, you know. Well, you'll definitely like the essay then, because yeah. that is the through line through the whole thing is death as you know, not just uh, you know, in some ways an opposite, um, but also uh, a the embodiment of a kind of criticism of the judge system. That every time you want to kind of like pin down what exactly is it that you're objecting to about the dark judges, it's, it's like yeah, but that also applies to you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, what, what about you? I mean, obviously, you, you've you've got an oversight on the whole thing, um, but also contributing your your own piece. Has, has there been something that that uh, has has actually? You know what? Let's let's deal with this separately. So let's let's, yeah. let's talk about your essay, and then we'll talk about 
the the, the process of editing them. When you were writing, because uh, you, you you write about uh, technology and and things like the, the mm. mechanismo program and and, and robots in in Judge Dredd's world, was there something that really uh, hit you during the course of uh, of the, the process? Yeah, I mean, you know, I chose because I love the the first like mechanismo story. Um, you know, is a is a classic. So I, I like the, that that idea. And I thought, yeah, ro- you know, robot judges are, are you know, it's this great idea, and you know, like this idea of technology coming into our life and, and this other thing. And it to me, the starting point was just that. It was like, oh yeah, Dread Standis, he doesn't trust them, you know. But then why not? Like, you know, that was the question I went to sort of start to approach. But as I dug into it, like I did a whole bunch of research about current technology, you know, not, not even like bleeding edge, not, not, not like, you know, stuff we don't see, but like stuff that's going on. And it was a massive eye opener to me that I was like, Oh no, we, you know, for me, robotics in factories is those big yellow arms you see put in the cars together. And I think they're pretty clever. And then I find out, Oh no, Ford has an actual robot that carries boxes and, and walks around on two legs. And, and, you know, it's called digit. I think, so, you know, and I was like, all right, that's creepy. And then, you know, the more it came was like this thing around, there was a survey done about a bunch of things, Chris questionnaire, and this thing of, of within the next couple of years, automation can take a bunch of jobs away. You know, we're all an algorithm away from losing our jobs. But then 70% of people are actually willing to have both brain and or um, physical augmentation in order to keep their job. And so to me, the thing that sort of the, 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 the development of the essay came to this thing of this morality line of... Where, where do we draw the line? Dread is the line. And even he starts to sort of step back with the introduction of the, the later judges, uh, the later robot judges. But like, you know, we'll go mobile phones, you know, oh, I'm, not, well, I'm not sure how I feel about this, the, the amount of sort of you know, tracking or anything that can be done on my phone. More, well, I'm really uncomfortable with that. How long have you had a phone? 10 years. Oh, okay. Are you really that worried about it? No. And then, you know, well, what about your laptop? What about your tablet? All this technology that's increased Alexa, Google, you know, Google, whatever, Siri, all this stuff that I was like, this morality line just keeps creeping up. And it's sort of like, we're, we're all against it. You'll see all the essays or all this, the articles against it. And then we see the benefits or we see the entertainment value and the morality line crept. And that was what, that's what drove me was this idea then of like, as you say about the inevitable, what is the inevitable of this, of, where does this thing, you know, why is Judge Dredd against this idea of robot judges and what is going to push that morality line back? Um, and it gets there. You know, the, the, there's more recent stories with um, machine law in particular, where you meet the new versions, the most recent versions, where they've got a personality, they've got compassion, and actually the robot judges are probably a bit more, you know, human, in inverted commas, than, than the actual judges. It starts to sort of, you know, this interesting complexity between them. So I, I just find that fascinating, and it was it was just a really sort of uh, a rabbit hole to go down. And uh, yeah, so that that was a great experience, sort of write that essay. And in terms of of, of bringing it all together, um, were, were there any areas that um, you wish you had been able to to to, to address with a, an essay from someone? Um, Writing the essay or, or, or editing the essays was was interesting because it's my first real experience. Like I've you know I've I've done stuff for my own things. I've got podcasts and I've written blogs and that. So I've always tried to sort of you know, improve my skills with those. But having the responsibility of, of editing somebody else's work to me there was there was it was twofold. It was like well I'm responsible for this book. My name's on the front. It's got to be quality. You know Julian's got to sign off on it, so it can't be crap. I've got to do a good job. However, there was this question about what make, what gives me the right to actually question and give feedback to someone who is probably you know more at, academically you know able than me, and so there was that that was sort of at play quite a bit. But then everyone everyone we worked with was fantastic, open to discussion, open to feedback, open to sort of um, the ideas that we had. Um, but there was there was when I, when I got the list together when we had that list of all the essays, and I, I had another. I think six or seven I'd come up with later. Then I was like, these are the, when I had the original list, it was like, here's the proposals or here's the possible ideas. And then people could pitch their own ideas. But I ended up with like six, I think, left that were the one that original list that people didn't pick up. And there were, there were all kinds of things on there from, um, God, you trying to remember now. Um, you know, there was more stuff we wanted to do from some of the 90s stuff. There was like, I wanted to do an essay on some of the sort of the, 
the idea of humour in 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 dread, especially in that sort of like the early nineties, a bit more wacky stuff that sort of came around. I'd love to have done more on that. Didn't get to cover Necropolis. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> didn't. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm not really, you know, it was, it was a storyline. We didn't really get to go into space. There was a couple of things where I was like, you know, didn't really. There was a story, of, there was an idea for an essay I really wanted to cover about the judicial system across the world. You know, so we see the mega city ones, but then we also know there's like Judge Armitage and the judges, justice system in Brits, Britsit or, you know, the Australian system or the Irish system or, you know, the weird Egyptian, North African Egyptian system from Grant Morrison and, and, and uh, Mark Millar. So there's these ideas. I was like, those ones I'd like to do. So to be fair, there's probably enough for like a volume two. Um, and and also one of the, one of the things that was really interesting was I say as a, as we were doing this and pulling this together, and as Tony said, there was just this just this sort of reflection on the times in which we live. That I was like, when we get through this, there needs to be a reflection on this to say. How, how have we gotten through this and what what have we learned and what were those stories during this time i'd like to, i'd love to do a piece that said the the stories from like 2016 to 2021 or 2020 that say through this period of you know not just the trump years but like you know uh, the conservative government and the pandemic and everything else we've gone through like how did dread represent that and i think that's something i'd really like to re- revisit a, a, in the future so you know, it's on video now. Uh, Julian's just given the thumbs up. So I take that as a sequat green light. <laughs> Legally binding, I think. Yes, I, I believe so. <laughs> Well, thanks so much to Tony, Julian and Scott for that chat. Always great to have different perspectives on the future's greatest lawman. So uh, do pick up a copy of Judging Dread if you can. We will be back in seven days' time with another blast from the past um, with Angelic. Uh, the new series of Angelic starting in the Judge Dread magazine. Uh, we revisit an interview with uh, writer Gordon Rennie way back when uh, in the midst of time uh, to talk about that series. Uh, and also uh, Robin Smith, who uh, has uh, recently uh, had artwork in the 2080 sci-fi special um, big bumper interview with him from a few years ago, where uh, we go over his career, uh, not just as an artist, but also um, as uh, one of the editorial droids at 2000 AD, uh, someone who's who's who was there for uh, 2080's Golden Age. So uh, wonderful to, uh, uh, to 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 revisit those uh, those chats. If you're not picking up the magazine, what are you doing? It's uh, it's just it's fantastic. It's, it's had such a great run recently, and uh, particularly with things like Devil in War, the Return of Angelic. You know there'll be more Lawless in the future. Dan Abnett and Phil Winslade. So uh, make sure you're picking that up every month or add it to your subscription. Some great deals on uh, on Cranberry subscriptions on the 2080 website. But as I say, we should be back in seven days' time. Until then, Earthlets, keep staying safe. Uh, look out for the uh, eh, interesting weather and splendid Verthwick. Alert! 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 Fill power levels dangerously high. Alert! Alert! The 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com.